It's hard to recall, but I want to say that the first movie that ever really left me asking, what the f*** did I just watch, was Mulholland Drive. I was a teen and a friend of mine put it on in part because it had a reputation as a mind melter, but mostly because he'd heard that there was some pretty righteous female frontal nudity. <laughs> Man, the things that we were willing to watch for a little female frontal nudity back then. Anyway, we were definitely treated to the aforementioned female nudity, courtesy of Miss Laura Herring, but we got a lot more than we bargained for. Weeks later, we were still discussing our various theories on what the movie was about, and even though I don't think we ever got to the bottom of it, the experience left me with a fondness for difficult movies. The ones that don't just give it up for you because you asked. The ones that make you work for it a bit. Bo is Afraid is just such a movie, and it's really got its hooks in me. I'm going to spoil literally everything that I know how to spoil about this movie, so before I do, here is the spoiler-free review. If you like films that make obvious sense, leave you with a feeling of closure, and don't involve labyrinthine incursions into the psyche, it is unlikely that you will enjoy this movie. But if you enjoy movies that provide the viewer with a puzzle for exploration and discussion and sharing different interpretations, then Ari Aster has provided you with a feast of provocative confusion. Bo is Afraid is a 2023 film from Studio A24 and blah blah blah. This part just always bores me to tears. I hate doing it every time. Let's just get on with it. Ari Aster, Joaquin Phoenix, it's about a guy named Bo, and beyond that, most of it is really up for debate. But before we get into the nitty gritty, let's get down to the nitty gritty. A rant. We need to normalize people being able to admit they don't know what they're talking about. When speaking about films like Bo is Afraid, I've noticed a couple of irritating trends. The first is for people to claim that Bo is simply crazy and that the events that we're seeing are the products of his deranged consciousness, implying that behind them, there is a normal version of events. This trope of the unreliable narrator has been used to great effect in films like Goodnight Mommy, Jacob's Ladder, I'm Thinking of Ending Things, and many others. Unfortunately, now that everyone is aware of this trope, it's become the default way of responding to anything confusing, erasing rather than explaining the events of the movie. Don't worry about what any of it means, Bo is just crazy. Important portions of the film get dismissed as unreal, and things that aren't actually in the film are theorized as the real events. But there's rarely much attention given to how these events that we see map onto the real events. In the end, what you're left with isn't an interpretation, it's a fan fiction. Applied to Bo is Afraid, the problem is especially clear because there's simply no non-insane version of the story. The causal effects of the events that we witness are carried forward from one scene to the next so straightforwardly that in order to concoct some normal version of events, you have to basically say that enormous chunks of the film are simply hallucinations. Unlike a film like Goodnight Mommy, there is no way for the audience to confidently distinguish between real and imagined events. Let's take one theory that I've heard as an example. It claims that Bo is hallucinating all of this because of his new medication. Always with water. Always. If this is the case, then A, why is his psychiatrist prescribing a drug that can cause severe hallucinations? B, why is this drug on the market in the first place? C, why does Bo not immediately realize that this isn't normal and call his shrink back? All of these things are so bizarre and implausible that it hardly makes sense to argue them. What's more, this explanation is as unsatisfying, and let's just face it, it's as lame as ending the whole thing by saying, and then Bo woke up in his bed and realized he'd dreamed the whole thing. What are we supposed to glean from the story of Bo? Nothing. He's just a crazy guy. How incredibly boring. All of these attempts to create rationality out of the events of the movie mutilate what they pretend to make sense of in the process. Bo is Afraid is a work of surrealist cinema, which means it plays by different rules. Surrealism is a form that intentionally uses irrationality and shocking imagery and events to blur the lines between reality and fantasy, between reason and unreason. Oftentimes this is done as a way of freeing the mind to express and explore truths that are otherwise impossible to get at. Countless movies involve plots that are implausible or at the very least improbable and require some degree of suspension of disbelief. Surrealism simply abolishes the reality limit altogether, allowing the mind to create as it does in dreams. This is why Bo is Afraid has such a dreamlike quality to it, and I suspect that Ari Aster has some familiarity with psychoanalysts like Carl Jung, who believed that dreams were a place where our unconscious minds could attempt to reveal truths that our conscious minds couldn't handle, but we'll discuss more of that later. The second trend, and by far the more annoying, is to identify one particularly obvious thematic element and claim that the movie is about that. This is how you wind up with claims like, Bo is Afraid is about generational trauma, or living with anxiety, or mommy issues, or my personal favorite, Bo is Afraid is Ari Aster performing self-therapy. 
Sometimes this can be the product of a person honestly not understanding the way that artistic interpretation works, and that's fine. But at other times, it feels like these takes are so bad that they must be the work of a malicious stupidity bent on intentionally shutting down discussion, rather than just admitting that they don't get it. You see, I named a theme, and that absolves me of having to expend any more thought. End of story. How does this single theme rationalize the events of the story, binding them together into some meaningful whole? Shut up, nerd! Why are you thinking about it? Just enjoy the experience! These kinds of takes have multiplied like sewer rats since the widespread proliferation of misapplied therapeutic lingo throughout popular discourse. Now anybody with a passing knowledge of pop psychology can claim this inside angle on some piece of art, while in reality short-circuiting any interesting discussion with this barrage of thought-terminating banalities. Yes, obviously, Bo is Afraid deals with subjects like anxiety, family trauma, and all the rest, but to say that the movie is about them is insultingly reductionist, or as I like to say, stupid. The movie is about a man named Bo and the things that happened to him. The point of interpretation is to identify what meaning, what lessons, we, the audience, can take from Bo's story. It should make your experience of the story deeper, richer, more interesting, not less. If the only meaning that you could make of Bo is Afraid is that there is a thing called generational trauma and that it exists, or that this is what living with anxiety is like, then sorry, you did a bad job. Media analysis. It's bad and you should feel bad. All that said, I'm not going to pretend that I have the definitive understanding of this movie. Bo's Afraid treats its three hour runtime like a luxurious canvas and it covers a lot, and I'm not sure that all of it comes together, but I do think that the film has something to say and it's a little more complicated than Mommy Issues Bad, yo. Rant disengaged, let's get into that nitty gritty. Nitty gritty. One clear influence on the film is the work of Franz Kafka, the. What was his nationality again? German? Was it... Is it German? Kafka is a surrealist author and his works are iconic. Their fame comes from producing a sense of unreality coupled with oppressive anxiety and uncertainty, and their bizarre dreamlike plots examine various aspects of society and how individuals relate to it. Metamorphosis tells the story of a young salesman who wakes up one morning to discover that he's transformed into a giant cockroach. He's unable to work and he becomes a financial and social drain on his family, who all live with him. His grotesque appearance becomes an embarrassment, and they slowly grow to resent, and then to hate him because of how he disrupts their social relations. Obviously, there's a question of how we're meant to understand the story, since it's unlikely that you're going to be turning into a man-sized bug anytime soon. When you encounter stories in which literally impossible events happen, chances are you're meant to be interpreting them symbolically. Turning into a bug doesn't happen. Have you ever heard of insect politics? Neither have I. Well, it mostly doesn't happen, so it's more likely that this transformation is simply a metaphor, which it, of course it is. In the same way that George Orwell used the setting of a farm to write his allegorical critique of communism, Kafka is attempting to explore the subject of alienation from other people, even those who ought to know and love us best. Bo? Hi, Mom. Kafka's other major work, The Trial, deals with the way that social constructs like the legal system can take on a bizarre and human life of their own. Joseph K. is arrested by agents from an unspecified government organization, and no one will tell him his crime. In trying to navigate the legal world and prove his innocence, K. discovers that the legal system is itself nothing like what people believe it to be. Rather than a rational and just system, it is discovered to be a quagmire of perverse incentives and outright absurdities. As with the trial, events that occur in Bo is Afraid often have a passing resemblance to reality, but are extended or exaggerated in ways meant to dramatize the subjects of Ariaster's interest. However, at other times, the film takes on a clearly mythological aspect, much like the metamorphosis. And in these moments, the events of the story are meant to be read literally, but interpreted figuratively. And much like Kafka, Astor seems to have hidden away a potent critique of contemporary society inside of this cinematic juggernaut. What did I say? Didn't I say I wasn't going to do this again with you tonight? I'm about to feel hurt. You're about to really hurt me. There are some reviewers that have concluded that Bo's mother Mona is basically innocent and that Bo is just refusing to take responsibility for his own mommy-centered foibles. This is what I like to call big wrong. Mona is f***ing evil. There is no other way to say it. On my first draft, I described her as a quote-unquote real piece of work, but after actually putting her crimes to paper, that description doesn't even come close to covering it. She is an actual villain, and after her actions have been fully examined, the idea that Bo should simply take responsibility and stop blaming his mother for his sad state 
is like telling someone crippled by a drunk driver that they should just get up and walk and stop blaming the person that hit them. Some aspects of Mona's villainy are obvious, like her faking her death to manipulate her son, or deliberately traumatizing him with stories about how his own father and grandfather died, or killing her housekeeper, or setting Bo up with a phony shrink who illegally records and shares all of their sessions with her, or locking her son in an attic for decades, see what I mean about evil? But other aspects are less obvious, and incredibly, when understood, they're even worse. One thing that we know about Mona is that she has more money than God. She lives in an unbelievably ornate mansion, and this makes it a little odd that Bo lives in such awful conditions. Maybe he lives in this dump because he's trying to get some separation from her, and this is the best that he could do, but that doesn't really seem to fit. Bo doesn't seem like a man who's even capable of understanding what he needs. Come to think of it, we don't really even know what it is Bo does. It's not really clear where Mona's money comes from either, at least not until the end of the film where we get some idea of her work. When Bo finally arrives at his mother's house, he finds that the funeral service has already ended, but throughout the house there are displays celebrating Mona's life and accomplishments. One of them is a timeline for the company that his mother founded. It features advertisements of various products over the years, ranging from baby food to microwavable meals to medications aimed at treating ADHD and depression, but the central theme is safety. While Mona's company may provide all kinds of different products, they're all bound together under this general umbrella of the assurance of their safety. Multiple ads feature the exact words, perfectly safe in bold print. This creates an interesting irony given that Mona admits that she tried to make Bo afraid of the world. Is my baby hungry? Is he healthy? Is he scared enough of the world? But it gets way weirder. If you look at the products being advertised, there's a strange resonance between them and our own world. Baby food replacing breast milk, microwavable meals replacing real food. It turns out that Bo is still eating these meals as an adult. At the movie's start, before we can understand its significance, we see him heat up a Bountiful Pastures microwavable meal, a miserable abomination labeled as Hawaiian and Irish fusion. And this is clearly just marketing being used to sell something that would otherwise be immediately recognizable as a disorganized bowl of pig slop. Most of the other products appear to be different pharmaceutical interventions for things like ADHD, acne, and teenage depression. Aster seems to be trying to get at this idea of various normal parts of human life being defined as problems and then becoming an excuse for the promotion of chemicals to alter brain chemistry and hormones, which then produce negative side effects which become the excuse for further interventions. You may have noticed that many of the advertisements feature Bo himself. At best, this may simply mean that Mona used him for the image, but at worst, it implies that Mona used her own son as a guinea pig for her company's products. But at least these products are perfectly safe, right? Well, it turns out the rabbit hole goes a little bit deeper. Remember those pills that Bo's shrink put him on? I'm gonna write you a script for a very cool new drug, which I think... The ones which are implied to have some pretty serious negative side effects when taken without water? Well, given that we know that Bo's shrink is on Mona's payroll, as is the doctor that he stays with after the car accident, it's not much of a stretch to think that she is still testing drugs on him. Bo turns around and sees an advertisement for Big W Housing. These installations are described as rehabilitation neighborhoods, which are devoted to the housing and support of residents who have abused our products. This indicates that the products that Mona's company creates are a little less than safe. The line about abusing products is obviously just a vile corporate doublespeak, intended to avoid taking responsibility for the lives that have been ruined by these products, which are apparently dangerous enough that this soulless corporation has been motivated to put up 38 of these things in 29 states. But here's the kicker. The apartment seen in the ad? That's Bo's apartment building. He lives in one of his mother's rehabilitation neighborhoods for the people who have been damaged by her perfectly safe products. Bo lives in the world created by his mother. The insanity of Bo's home is a direct consequence of her greed and irresponsibility. Mona has controlled every aspect of her son's life, manipulating him through his care for her to keep him in abject misery. And all of this while having the absolutely inconceivable gall to call it love. It is hard to imagine a more hideous monster, and the worst part is that while the details of the scenario are fantastical, people like this are all too real. I like that you're not on my show. Thank you. It's a little funny to me that the theme that was most obvious to me is the one that I really haven't heard many people talking about, emasculation. Bo is an extraordinarily emasculated character. 
It's not just his high-pitched pleading voice or his constant crying or the fact that he uses the word mommy. All of those are merely superficial. Bo's emasculation is far deeper. Throughout the film, he is constantly apologetic, terrified of causing anyone else harm or even inconvenience, afraid of putting someone out or saying something that will upset them. He tries to make himself as inoffensive as possible. He's even afraid to orgasm, having been told by his mother that his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather all died in this manner. This has resulted in a stunting of his entire being, such that even his testicles have become enlarged with all the backed up juice. Of course, this isn't actually possible, but in case you don't believe me, here's a Vulture magazine article interviewing an actual doctor to verify that it's not possible. Can you imagine being called up by like an actual journalist to answer questions like, if you don't orgasm, will your testicles swell to the size of baseballs? Like, what, what exquisite misery. But Bo's emasculation hasn't just deformed his scrotum. It's prevented him from living life. In the scene after his escape from the doctor's house, he watches a play in which he's presented with an archetypical masculine journey. The character on the stage has recently lost both parents. He mourns them until an angel arrives to tell him that his mourning has honored his parents, and he is now able to move forward with life, living life with their blessing. Bo's own longing to be freed from the impositions of his mother is so powerful that he projects himself onto the play's character with an intensity that causes him to lose awareness of his own reality in favor of the reality of the play. Within this dream, he journeys to a new land where he learns a trade and makes a living and eventually takes a wife and has three sons by her. All of this is steeped in the heroic imagery of a classically masculine agrarian lifestyle. But reality reasserts itself when, after being united with his long-lost dream sons, he confesses to them that he never had sex, and one asks how they could have come to be then. Even in dreams, he can't escape his own emasculation. The theme of emasculation reaches its apogee when Bo confronts his mother in the film's last quarter. Over the course of two hours, Ari Aster has slowly been developing the question of Bo's father. Initially, the issue seems clear enough. Bo is walking through his apartment and he passes a photo and says, Hey dad. We see the photo for a couple of seconds and we imagine that Bo's dad has simply passed on from natural causes, as you'd expect. But if you look closer at that photo, there's actually something not quite right about it. First of all, the father's face is blurred so that his features, aside from that absolute beak of a nose, are undefined. It's got a pretty masculine vibe though. He's wearing jeans with a tucked in flannel shirt, but hold up. What is he actually doing? Is he hammering a nail into a brick wall? I'm not a carpenter, but I don't think you do this. This indicates some kind of absurdity at the heart of Bo's idea of his father, the idea that he's received from his mother. Throughout the film, Bo makes reference to a recurring dream that he's had for some time now, perhaps even from childhood. In the dream, he's in a bath, and he sees another version of himself. His mother tries to undress this other Bo, but the boy refuses and demands to know what has happened to his father. Bo's mother tries to manipulate the boy by saying he's hurting her, but the boy doesn't care. He demands to know the truth again. With this, the mother grabs him by the wrist and takes him to a ladder leading up to the attic and forces him to go up. As an adult, Bo has finally achieved the courage to do the same thing as the other Bo in the dream. I met my father, I met the man in the woods, and I know. Why did you lie to me? He demands to know the truth from his mother, and like the other boy, he's led to the attic, where his mother, just before closing the flop door behind him, tells him that his dream wasn't a dream, it was a memory. A dream. You should get it, you stupid idiot. That wasn't a dream. That was a memory. Wait, wait. Inside the attic, Bo finds his twin brother, an emaciated wretch of a man. He's even still wearing the same shirt that he had on the day of his imprisonment. But as if that horror were insufficient, Bo finally meets his father, a giant sentient dick, complete with a set of enormous balls. The creature greets him with cries of adoration, much like his own when greeting his imagined children in the world of the play earlier. This terror is then surpassed yet again when the insane veteran, who really ought to be dead at this point, reappears and attacks Bo's father, unloading his mag into one testicle and then beginning to stab the other in a clear effort at castration. Obviously, this makes no sense unless one interprets it symbolically. 
Houses are frequently used to represent a person's psyche, with attics and basements representing locations of the repressed or unconscious. In the English classic Jane Eyre, Jane's love interest, Mr. Rochester, lives in a home that appears to be haunted in some way. Odd things happen around the house, including a fire which threatens the man's life. Eventually, it's revealed that the haunting presence is actually Mr. Rochester's first wife, an insane woman. This symbolism is examined at length in the classic work of feminist literary theory, The Mad Woman in the Attic, but the important thing is to understand this idea of the conscious mind being haunted by the unconscious, where all of our repressed desires and drives are located. Bo is Afraid makes direct use of this literary and psychoanalytic background, and repurposes it, using the image of a mentally destroyed man trying to eradicate the last remnants of long-repressed masculinity, which has grown into something monstrous by being imprisoned in this way. At the film's climax, after witnessing the horror of his father in the attic, Bo is shamed by his mother one final time. He lies at her feet, and she launches into this psychotic screed in which her having given birth to Bo entitles her to absolute rights over him. You selfish little boy! What are you crying about? Do you have any idea what I had to go through to bring you into this world? In her mind, he is her property and must atone eternally for the crime of escaping her womb. Ultimately, she arrives at the realization that she hates her son, but just as she is about to utter these words, Bo the man emerges out of Bo the boy. According to Jungian psychoanalysis, the unconscious was not necessarily the home of irrational desires. It could also contain powerful truths that were, for whatever reason, simply too much for the conscious mind to bear. The truth that Bo is unable to face is that his mother is evil, but at this moment of incomprehensible agony and horror, the barrier between the conscious and unconscious is briefly dissolved, and Bo acts decisively for the first time in his life, taking Mona by the throat and attempting to strangle her. It doesn't last long, his boy mind reasserts itself, and he looks with horror on what he's done, crying out mommy and asking if she can breathe. But ironically, the shock itself is enough to kill Mona, and she falls over dead into a glass display case. Try to steal anything, I swear! No, you already floated! You filled your stupid chest! During the period in which Bo is housed by the suburban couple, Holly Flax covertly hands him a note that says, stop incriminating yourself. But how can you stop incriminating yourself when you don't know what your crime is? The film itself is framed by this question of guilt. We are gathered now to assess the extent of the subject's guilt. In true Kafkaesque fashion, Bo's crime is unclear, and in the absence of specificity, it takes on a vast, almost universal quality, as if it were attached to his being rather than any specific action. Is he guilty of being a bad son? of not loving his mother enough, of being ungrateful for what she has supposedly done for him, of being ungrateful in general. One plot point that's easy to miss is that the suburbanites have actually been sent by Mona to retrieve Bo and then to test him, to test his resolve to make it to his mother's funeral. In order to pass the test, Bo would have to insist on being taken immediately to his mother's funeral, in spite of whatever inconvenience it caused to those who, as far as Bo knows, have taken him in simply out of the kindness of their hearts and without any consideration of his own injuries. He would, in effect, have to be a much more assertive and masculine person. Not only is Mona's test monstrously selfish, but the irony is that she is directly responsible for the fact that he isn't the kind of man who could pass it. This is like cutting someone's feet off and then requiring them to run an obstacle course. Ultimately, I think that Bo's crime is, as the title says, that he has been afraid. He's been too afraid to act decisively, and through this inaction, he's become a universal magnet for negativity. All throughout the film, Bo is blamed for things that he either hasn't done or things which he did for entirely justifiable reasons. Nevertheless, the objective reality of his innocence is constantly being overridden by a false reality imposed on him by others who have power over him. If you don't do it right now, I'm gonna make her pull my hair so hard that it detaches my scalp. And she'll say that you did it. I will. I remember that you did, I saw it. In the final scene, Bo is placed on trial before an amphitheater full of people. The prosecutor is Mr. Cohen, his mother's lawyer, and Mona sits beside him. Cohen's voice fills the room as he smears Bo's character, accusing him of hypocrisy for feeding pets but running away from a poor homeless man who just needed some food. But this is obvious bullshit. Like, 
If just using your human ability to understand the actions and motivations of other humans wasn't enough for you to identify this as bullshit, here's that same scene again. It's hot! The man literally throws a bowl of soup on the ground five seconds before chasing after Bo. We don't have insider knowledge of the other events that Cohen references, but we can assume that they are equally specious. A man in the distance tries to defend Bo, but eventually he's grabbed by bystanders and thrown to his death, leaving Bo without any kind of representation. Though the scene is darkly comedic, it's also horrifying. Outside of Bo's apartment in the beginning, there's this bizarre painting on one of the buildings that says, Jesus sees your abominations. It's striking for the way that it inverts the idea of Jesus as a benevolent redeemer and suggests a condemning judge who offers not grace, but contempt. There's no allusion to mercy or forgiveness, and this Jesus' face is a mask of disgust. But in the final analysis, the prospect of being judged by an omnipotent God is far preferable to this. God at least is able to know the truth of our lives. But imagine if, instead of an omniscient deity, one's final judgment had to be argued in front of a crowd of barely interested strangers who know nothing and are easily duped. Contrary to the words of Jesus who claimed that the meek would inherit the earth, Ariaster shows us a mortifying world in which the meek are trampled under the lies of the strong. Jean-Paul Sartre famously said, hell is other people, and if you make it to the end of Bo is Afraid, you may have some idea of what he meant. So, what, after all of that, are we left with? What is Bo is Afraid really about? Well, to put it simply, it's about Fight Club. Or rather, it's the same subject as Fight Club, but, but told as something like Fight Club's photo negative. It's meant to express an anxiety about modernity and a specific modern attitude towards the human condition, namely that all problems are technical problems which can be sorted out through various perfectly safe interventions by experts like doctors and therapists, etc. The kind of interventions that are supplied by Mona Wasserman's company. These efforts at perfecting the human experience claim to have eliminated any need for the masculine in society, which is why, as we are so often told, the future is female. But in reality, these interventions and this attitude not only fail to do what they advertise, the hidden costs that they bear on the human spirit are maddening. The revelation that Bo's neighborhood and all of the insanity that we see there are actually consequences of chemical interventions meant to solve things as trivial as teenage acne is a brilliant metaphor for this process. Bo is Afraid is fundamentally about the failure to manage these consequences and the costs that they have on the human being, all told through the story of a neurotic middle-aged Bo who is the perfect victim of this cult, whose life has been entirely controlled by the devouring feminine impulse represented by Mona. This obsession with safety and perfecting the human condition is represented by the utopian middle-class suburbia where Bo stays under the care of the doctor. This environment is like a guarded retreat from the chaos of the urban slum where Bo resides, and Aster is here making a statement of social class. It's no surprise that these people are somehow in the service of Mona. The husband is even shown to be one of her employees. They're sweet. Too sweet, even. Their ingratiating manner comes across as fake and condescending. But through the couple's daughter and the mentally destroyed veteran, we see the madness of Bo's world is making incursions into the suburban fantasy land. The daughter is bitter and resentful and into drugs. Her cruelty towards Bo, a totally helpless man, is an indication of developing sociopathy. Her hatred is not for Bo, but for the world around her, but she's unable to understand this, and in the end, she suffers a mental collapse, destroying herself because she can't destroy what's killing her spirit. During the play in the woods, Bo is drawn into a fantasy depicting a well-known masculine heroic journey, in which a man contends with nature, and out of nature forges a life for himself. But Bo's heroic journey involves traveling through this socially constructed world of controls and false promises, and most of all, unrealized fears. Bo's fear, carefully cultivated by his mother and the world around him, his inability to accept the negative consequences of decisive action, have turned his life into a carnival of miseries. The message is clear. Without the ability to face your fears, without the ability to willingly accept the pain that is a natural consequence of making tough choices, life becomes a hell too terrible to endure, and this nightmare ultimately kills him, but not before he has his own small moment of triumph. At the end of his trial, right before his unusual execution, Bo realizes that he is going to die, that the thing that he has feared above all is about to happen. And at this moment, it's like he realizes that he's faced all of his fears. He hasn't done it with any kind of dignity or heroism. He hasn't done it by choice, but what does that matter in the end? He's been through the fire, even if he had to be drugged, kicking and screaming the entire way. 
And as he understands this, we see him finally become calm and dignified. He has accepted his fate. Maybe his life could have gone differently if he'd reached this understanding sooner, but in the end, does it make such a difference? It is a noble thing to be able to face the end of your life calmly, and Bo is at least able to find this dignity before the end. We should all be so lucky. Hi, you made it all the way to the end. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please consider leaving a like and possibly even subscribing. These things take a lot of work and I'd like to continue making them and every little bit of encouragement and support means a lot to me. I am currently working on drafts for the next couple of videos, an analysis of Ralph Fiennes' The Forgiven based on the Lawrence Osborne novel and a deep dive into the social commentary and hidden themes of Michael Douglas's Falling Down, a movie that I've had mixed feelings about for years. Anyway, thanks again for watching and take care of yourself.